I'm joined today by Professor Lawrence Krauss. He is a theoretical physicist, cosmologist, a professor of physics, and director of the Origins Project at Arizona State University. It's great to talk to you. You know, growing up, I don't even remember when I first had this idea, but in listening to many of the religious stories that we hear about the origins of the universe, I would think to myself, you know, I'm not really finding the story of a man in the sky and some kind of different incarnation to be reliable. I'm not finding myself swayed by it. But, you know, if I was to come up with an idea that at least seems more more likely to me than that, even though I can't prove it, rather than man in the sky, I might say, you know, if everything I was experiencing, seeing, hearing, touching was part of some computer simulation set up by a greater being than me, that actually seems to me more plausible. And and later I found out that there are actually theories around some brain in a vat or the universe is a simulation. So was I I certainly wasn't the first to think of this, but what is the kind of scientific basis for these ideas? Well, I, you know, I think I'm not 100 percent certain what the scientific basis is. I think mo many people have wondered that I, it's it, just like many people dream of flying. I think many people wonder if the if sort of the universe around them is created as as an illusion for them and um and of course the movie the matrix promoted that kind of notion and uh the first thing i'd say is you know we can't prove we're not in this in a simulation if the simulation is good enough um then then the point is what's the difference if we're trying to understand the nature of our reality and the whole reality was a simulation if the simulation has the laws of nature built into it then our job is to understand the laws of nature and how the universe behaves. Uh, it's hard to imagine, of course, that such a simulation actually exists in spite of the fact that we have wonderful virtual reality that's getting better and better all the time. Uh, but it, from my point of view, the, the, the issue of whether we, the universe is, is, is a, a simulation or quote unquote real is irrelevant because if it's if the simulation is so good to appear to be real, then what's the difference between that and reality? Well, with the with the exception that if by finding out for sure whether we're in a simulation, we were somehow able to get around that and see what is creating the simulation, then it would become relevant. Yeah, of course. But the point is, everything we know about science tells us that there's no evidence of any plan or purpose or design. So if there were, if it was a simulation, it would it, it, it's remarkable in the sense that it seems purposeless. It's hard to imagine. So if we were to find some purpose to the universe, then that might give evidence that it might be a simulation. But but in fact, the progress of science over the last 400 years has been precisely the opposite, namely that there's no evidence of any purpose or plan or design. Uh, in fact, everything every day we learn th things that appear to make the universe seem more random and haphazard, including our own existence, that the existence of the Higgs boson that allowed us to exist appears to be an accident in many ways. And so most of the things we see at a fundamental level appear to suggest quite the opposite. Now, the one area where, where science really has led to some sort of support for the notion of at least the question of whether the illusion of reality is really an illusion is this notion that perhaps our ideas of dimensions are, are anecdotal. Namely, that just as a hologram allows you to encode the information of a three-dimensional room in a two-dimensional plate, you can look around and see people behind other people, etc., unlike a real photograph, it's been argued that perhaps you can, that, that, a, um, that our notions of dimensions are an illusion. Namely, that all the information of, say, a three-dimensional space uh, and a four-dimensional universe, three dimensions of space and one dimension of time, could somehow be encoded on the surface. Mm. And that the, the extra dimension is kind of redundant. So everything that all of the, our experience of a three-dimensional world was really established by conditions somehow at a, on a two-dimensional surface or something like that. Or normally this is applied to higher dimensions, a four-dimensional space being related to a five-dimensional space. There, there is progress related to string theory that shows that the laws of nature in a space of one dimension are in some sense equivalent to a very different set of laws of, um, of, of nature in a space of a different number of dimensions. And so people have been talking about whether the universe is a hologram in a sense and whether, and whether what we experience is really 
dictated by a different number of dimensions. It's all very exciting mathematics. Right now, it's not clear that any of it relates to, to the real world in which we live. The, the cases in which you can relate different numbers of dimensions are very special cases where the mathematics is very special, and they're not it's not the case in our universe. So, so while these questions and issues are very fascinating from a speculative point of view, right now there's no evidence that our universe is a hologram. But more importantly, there's certainly no evidence, even if in some, some aspects of our universe are an illusion, there's no evidence that that illusion was created by an intelligent entity. In fact, every bit of evidence suggests quite the opposite. Um, what, what is very real? In the universe, you do a much better job, I think. What is very real is the the fact that you and I both seem to have conversations time and time again with those who seem to cite the Bible as proof that the Bible was written by God. And, you know, just yesterday I interviewed this guy called Carl Gallups, and he has a theory about a rabbi and Ariel Sharon's death and a whole thing. And to, to not bore you with the details, I actually, uh, I think the interview went okay, but you you really debate at length, people like William Lane Craig and these very, very eloquent, very good speakers who are coming from a very religious point of view. And I think you do a really great job of it. And I'm actually kind of coming to you for advice on a specific point, which is uh, where can you kind of anchor the conversation when you're speaking to someone who insists on going back to the argument that you can't prove that they're wrong. So intellectually, I kind of understand why that doesn't make sense. But oftentimes in the midst of an interview, I get kind of trapped there and I'm not exactly sure how to circumvent those arguments. So how, how would you advise me or, or who did you study to learn to do it? <laughs> well, I, I, I um, a lot of it I learned from the School of Hard Knocks, being involved in debates and, and being caught um, uh, unawares, I guess. And so you learn from from bad experiences, when you get burned, you try not to get burned again. Right. Um, most of the people I debate are far. I, you know, I have debated William Lane Craig, but he's not one of the people on my list that I consider a significant person. Um, no, certainly, certainly though his his his, his speaking his, skills are good, even if his ideas yeah, lack. Yeah, you know? yeah. yeah he's, he, rhetorically, as a debater, he was good. But yeah. once you got out of the debate format, it was clear that he was out of his league. So you know, debates are not meant to be informative. Formal debates are meant to be um, rhetorical devices for for. Uh, convincing people of a point and not to really provide information. And so I try and get out of that format, first of all, where mm. there's a five minutes here, five minutes there, another counter five, because you never can really have the kind of discussion and engaging them in questions about, you know, so it's true that I, you can't, I mean, the point is there's lots of things you can't prove to be wrong and, uh, and God may be one of them. But, you know, the, the example I often use is one of Bertrand Russell who said, well, you know, I can't prove there isn't a beautiful China teapot orbiting Jupiter. But that doesn't make it likely or reasonable. And so the question is to try and probe, to do two things, to try and probe the why, why they insist upon something for which there's no evidence, and, and, and try and trap them up in logical contradictions. And then, in particular, a number of people, Craig is one, but, you know, utilize, make claims based on science that they don't understand. And so... Um, it's very useful to point out that the understanding is incorrect, I think. And so, it's, you know, often these people like to have it both ways. Well, science can't prove this, but we can use science to prove what we want when we need to. Well, and that's something that happens with conspiracy theories, I find, where the impetus, the, the evidence used to um, uh, uh, point to a conspiracy theory is the same media evidence that is called inaccurate for disproving that same theory. Yeah, and I, th I think, one ha what, look, the only way ultimately to convince people of, of, of um, to make, I think to get people to think about things is to point out the, their own misconceptions, point out the logical inconsistencies or the fact that if X, if X is true, that implies Y, but Y is obviously not true. And so as a physicist, when I'm teaching, the, the most effective teaching tool is to get students to realize their own misconceptions by understanding, by leading to a logical contradiction. And what I try and do when I, in the cases where I reluctantly agree to have a dialogue with people who I'd rather not be on stage with, mm. um, because sometimes I think it's important to realize that most of these people want to be on stage with people like me or, or maybe on a show like you because it gives them credibility. Because when people hear them or see them, they figure, well, you know, they must be reasonable and they sound reasonable. It's like he said, she said. So I, I refuse to do debates in general, say against UFO 
abduction people for that reason, because they all beg to be on stage with me. And even um, marginal individuals like Craig, I, I certainly, I, in a very specific case, I agreed to do this. But in general, I, I won't debate, I will debate issues that are relevant, but I won't debate obvious nonsense, because all it does is raise the profile of the of the people who are promoting the nonsense because people who many people of course don't aren't aware of the issues and if they sound reasonable then then they they come away thinking well you know there's two sides to the story but as i often say the great thing about science is there's usually just one side the other side is just wrong and and that's what makes give science progress because we can show that if it disagrees with the evidence of experiment we throw it out and that's what makes science wonderful is there aren't always two sides to every story and, uh, and we should celebrate that fact. All right, Professor Lawrence Krauss, of course, the Origins Project at Arizona State University. You can check it. You're big on YouTube. It's amazing how much YouTube stuff there is of you. Yeah, I know. I, I, I try to say no to many times when people try and film me <laughs> on YouTube too much. But we are having a neat event this weekend uh, in Origins um, uh, called Parallel Realities, Probing Fundamental Physics, which will have a public event with three Nobel laureates. And it's going to be a, a wonderful event. Uh, exploration of the fundamental physics governing the universe and the question is our universe necessary it'll be live but it'll also be archived and again visible on youtube <laughs> okay thanks so much